Let's talk about the early warning signs of colon cancer you absolutely do not want to ignore. So when I give you these six warning signs, just realize these are indicators. They're not meant to diagnose you. Indicators are symptoms that there is a situation, but it doesn't tell you what it is unless you look at all the information. But here's the thing. 50% of the time, there is no early warning signs. So it is important not to ignore these signs, but to understand them and, and pay attention to them. Now, I do want to mention polyps, the little mini tumors that can grow in your uh, colon. And uh, a lot of times people think that if you have polyps, that means you have cancer. No, it could be a benign little tiny tumor that does not grow, it does not turn into cancer. In fact, 80% of the time, there's only a very, very tiny risk between 0% to 2% risk of getting a cancer. There are various risk factors that people talk about, you know, like smoking and drinking and junk food and obesity and H. pylori. And that's a microbe that tends to live in the stomach, but it can travel different places. And then there's this topic of red meat or processed meat that you may have heard of. They always tend to talk about that. There was a group that concluded that it's a probable carcinogen, okay? But the data and the evidence is pretty weak, especially since this new report came out in JAMA, which was a, a bigger evaluation of the data on red meat and processed meat. And they found out if you actually include carbohydrates into the equation, there's no association between red meat or even processed meat and cancer. And I'm going to put that link down below. I hope you read it because there's been this massive push to make meat the villain, when in fact, um, that may not be true. There's a huge difference between different types of red meat, right? You have grass-fed, grass-finished meat versus grain-fed meat. Did they evaluate those two? No. They lumped everything in together, and their evidence was based on observational studies using questionnaires. And they ignored a lot of the data into this evaluation. And from my viewpoint, my opinion, uh, I do not think that red meat puts people at risk for cancer. Now, what about genetics? Well, yeah, there's a genetic component, but it's only 5%. Epigenetics, your lifestyle, are senior. And what you do, what you eat, your environment can control your genes. And then that leads us to this microbiome being out of balance. 80% of your immune system is these microbes in your gut. Your immune system is what protects you against cancer. I mean, look at another thing, antibiotics. In one report, it was like it increased your risk by 45%. So anything that can alter your microbiome in a negative way can put you at risk. So you wanna look at what causes inflammation in our gut, right? What can that be? Well, you have gluten, you have certain foods, seed oils, all these things can create inflammation in your gut, and then that can create a cascade and create alteration in this microbiome. But the microbiome can keep viruses in check. So, and I'm going to get to this, but when you eat food, you're really eating for two, okay? Your own cells and your microbiome. Okay, so what are the early warning signs that could potentially indicate colon cancer? Number one, blood in the stool. Okay, that's number one. But if there's blood in the stool deeper in your digestive tract, by the time it gets out, it's no longer going to be red. It'll be black. Number two, anemia. Okay, you're anemic, yet there's no reason to be anemic. That could be a potential indicator. Number three, the shape of the stool is thinner because there's obviously some cancer obstructing the colon, uh, altering the shape of your stool. Number four, you have constipation that seems to be getting worse. Why would that be? Because there's an obstruction in your colon. Number five, abdominal pain. Why would you have that? Well, because there's a certain mass that's growing in your colon and it's pushing on nerve endings. Number six, a sudden cause of weight loss or a loss of appetite. So again, these six indicators or clues are just indicators. They doesn't mean you have a problem and you, you don't want to treat them as a problem. You want to find out what's behind the problem. You know, the doctor comes in with authority and says, you have this period of time to live. And it's interesting how people tend to live that particular time. You're in a state of confusion. Everyone's telling you to do this or do that. And what do you do? Especially um, based on um, this 
particular person who should have been dead six years ago because he had a stage four cancer. And the prognosis of stage four cancer is like weeks to months. He should have been dead six years ago. He's still alive. And it'd be very important to study what he did. But we're going to talk about how to potentially avoid cancer, okay? What are some things you can do? As far as antibiotics, avoid those if you possibly can. Um, and if you have to take antibiotics, um, definitely fortify with a good probiotic. I think intermittent fasting and periodic prolonged fasting is essential. Why? Because it's going to clear out the colon. You allow your colon to have a chance to regenerate, heal, and not be so stressed 24-7. I think the cruciferous vegetables would be something to look at and consume, not every day, but maybe a few times a week. Uh, that would be like kale, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. Now, if I eat broccoli, it tears my gut up. So any of these cruciferous vegetables that you eat that you bloat, don't eat them. I can do cabbage and arugula very easily. And then when you ferment it, you get all this probiotic. Now, remember when I talked about inactivity? Well, activity as an exercise is probably one of the most potent things you can do to avoid cancer. Why? Because you're strengthening your mitochondria. And all cancer originates from a dysfunctional mitochondria. So by exercising, you actually generate more mitochondria and you actually strengthen the mitochondria. Things like garlic, thyme, sage, different spices, I think you should start putting those on your meat or your salad. You want to avoid certain things that create inflammation like gluten and grains and seed oils and junk foods. And also one point about inflammation is cancer tends to grow into areas of inflammation. Now, I think there's a lot more to be uh, learned about the microbiome. And if you have not seen this video right here, I think you'll enjoy it. Hey, before you leave, I just wanted to give you a little quick history on some of the books that I wrote. This was one of the first books. It's called Dr. Berg Body Shapes. It was my attempt at um, writing about body types. Uh, what was very interesting about this book is I actually did all the images myself. Uh, don't ask me why. Um, they look actually not quite as professional as some of the uh, images that I have in the new book. But anyway, this is my first attempt right here called Dr. Berg's Body Shape Diets. Uh, and then I wrote a book um, more extensive called The Seven Principles of Fat Burning. I don't even have a copy anymore, actually, um, because it's outdated. Uh, the next book, uh, I put about a thousand hours into this one right here called The New Body Type Guide, Major Updates on the Body Types. Uh, I put a lot of energy into this. Uh, it has professional images, graphics, all sorts of things. Now, the problem with this book is it doesn't really describe what this is really about. Body types are only a small portion of what's in this book. And that's why I changed the name to the Healthy Keto Plan, okay? If you happen to have this book, you don't really need this book because there's some only very, very minor updates. But if you don't have this, you need to get this one right here. Um, this book goes into every single detail that you would ever wanna know about. It goes into the seven principles of fat burning, it goes into hormones, uh, the body types, the basic keto plan. It goes into intermittent fasting. I talk about the 10 fat burning triggers and blockers and fat burning strategies with a lot of details in every single chapter. I go into body issues that interfere with losing weight. Um, there's very few people that just have a weight problem. They have a lot of body issues, whether it's sleeping problems, uh, stress problems, inflammation, menopause. I cover that extensively in this book. Then I talk about how to get rid of stress and I show you a technique. Uh, then I get into exercising. And then I have a lot of really good recipes in this book as well. So uh, this is a good reference guide. Um, on my website, if you get this book, you get this one free. It's called Healthy Keto Intermittent Fasting. This is the shortcut, a uh, quick guide to this book. And uh, the reason I created this book is to have you within 45 minutes learn how to do keto, okay, in intermittent fasting, exactly what you need to do. Then you can fill in the blanks with this book right here. So right now I'm doing a special. If you get this book, you get this one totally free, or you can go to Amazon and get these individually. So I just want to clarify the difference between this book and this updated one right here. If you don't have this, you need to get this right here. 
That way you can get the exact correct information to do it healthily.